Wow, thanks for being here. It's good to see you. And everyone tuned in online, it's good to see you too. If you're online and you have an opportunity to be here for second service, I would encourage you to do that. This is a special day. Jim Hobbs told us that we all that we have going on today, yeah, we have communion, we have baptisms, we have child dedications. So it's a big day in the life of the church. That's all of us, all of you. So thank you for being here. You know, we do child dedications regularly at Oak Point Church. And many of you may not have uh, been aware of that unless you've had a child dedicated, but we have not for years now been able to do them um, right here as a part of the service. And how great is that? Because these children are being dedicated to the Lord. The families are dedicating themselves to the Lord. And the congregation, all of you, all of us, we're dedicating ourselves to the Lord to support these families. So it's a big, big day. Why do we do it? It's a great church tradition. You know, it's not one of the ordinances of the church, but it is a great tradition, and it's biblical. You know, we see in the scriptures, in fact, David, in a couple different Psalms, you know, he talks about how children are a gift from the Lord. And all of us who've had children or grandchildren or been around children, we know that children are a gift from the Lord. In Psalm 139, David wrote, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He goes on, I already mentioned it in Psalm 127. David said, Children are a gift from the Lord. We know that. We get to celebrate that here today together. You know, Mary and Joseph, they brought Jesus to the temple as a part of their cultural um, uh, traditions and uh, from, from the law of Moses. They brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord. And in fact, we can see throughout the gospel accounts, Jesus had a very high opinion of children. Right? That was not uh, necessarily a part of that culture. You know, we value and treasure our children, and they treasured them too, but it just was expressed differently in that culture. But Jesus, he had a very high opinion of children. You may remember in the gospel accounts, it's in Mark chapter 10 is one of them, where parents were trying to bring children, little children, to Jesus so that he could bless them. Well, the disciples saw it, and they rebuked the parents. You know, they, they were trying to protect Jesus, doing what they thought they should do, but they, they didn't want parents to bring these children to Jesus. Jesus had more important things to do, right? That's what they thought. But the text says that Jesus was indignant. It's a strong word in Greek. He was, he was mad at them. He was upset at his disciples, not at the parents, not at the children, but he was upset that they were trying to prevent those children from coming to him. And Jesus, remember what he said there? Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God is made up of such as these. So Jesus had a tremendously high, uh, uh, placed a high value on children. The scriptures are complete. From the Old Testament, we see it all through Deuteronomy, all through the scriptures, including, including in the New Testament, instructions to parents about how parents are to rear their children. We're not going to cover all of those today. You're going to see and hear more of that um, a little bit later when we have the families uh, come up here. But the scriptures tell us that we are to rear our children with an orientation toward the Lord. And that's not only the parents' responsibility, that's the whole extended family. And that's the whole church family, that's all of us. To have an environment where the love of God and obedience to Jesus Christ is taught and is demonstrated. Yeah, we talk about it, we say it by word, but we also are challenged in the scriptures to live it out. So all of us have a part to play in this. So how do we do that? You know, how, how do we live that out? Well, the place to start in dedicating our children to the Lord, the place to start is by organizing our lives around Jesus Christ. 
right? As, as I already mentioned, it's not only the children who are being dedicated, it's the parents, it's the extended family, it's all of us who are being dedicated, who are dedicating ourselves to bring up these children, to rear these children in the, the discipline, uh, the instruction, the respect, the awe, the reverence of God. And the place to start as families and as a church is to orient our lives around Jesus Christ. Our lives need to be in orbit around Jesus Christ. That's how we start this process. That's how we live it out. We are to make Jesus Christ the very heartbeat and the center, the, the, the everything in our family life needs to revolve around him. And church family, everything in our church life needs to revolve around him. That's how we start this. I'm going to invite the, the Buttermore and the Bosher families and everyone who's with them to join me on stage. I love this part. You're gonna love this part too. This is so much fun. So church family, you're being called on today to dedicate yourself, to dedicate yourself to this responsibility. You're, you're being asked to commit your love, your support, your encouragement to these families as they rear these children. Wow, the Buttermores pulled out all the stops, right? Bosher family, why don't you come on up here as, as well? You know, what dedication is not? Let me, just a word about this. You're gonna hear a lot more about this later in, in Pastor Charlie's message, but uh, dedication, child dedication is not baptism, right? Uh, that's a whole different thing. Bapti we practice believer's baptism. You'll hear more about that later. Dedication, dedication is not an assurance of salvation. Right? These children are being dedicated today, but these children one day will make their own decision. These children will come to understand one day that they are sinners, that they need a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And they will have to come to the point where they put their faith and confidence in him alone to save them. Today is not that day. That day will come. We pray that that day will come. But today is a day when we dedicate them and when we celebrate these little ones. So understanding that children are a gift from God and they belong to him, with God's help and guidance, Brent, Natalie, Ira and Tiffany, and all of your family. You are committing yourselves today to rear them in the truth of God's word, to pray for them and with them, to guide them, to encourage them to trust Jesus as their savior, so that one day in the future, they will take part in an ordinance of the church, baptism, declaring their faith, their personal faith in Jesus Christ. I want to invite the Buttermores up. If you'll join me right up here. Everybody with them, gather around here. <laughs> gather around. Brent and Natalie, what declaration are you making today in, as you commit yourselves to rear Sophia? Thanks, Blaine. So Sophia Elizabeth Buttermore, today as your parents, we are committed to you to uh, be committed to God as the center and heartbeat of our family life. To train and encourage you with an orientation toward God. To teach you God's word. To instruct and model for you how to love and obey God. To provide for you. To correct you in love and gentleness. To love you unconditionally as a reflection of how God loves you. To lead and guide you to Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? How about a round of applause for the Buttermore family? Okay, keep a step up. I would like to invite the Bosher family, Bosher family up, along with Emily and Ezra and all of the family. Everybody, everybody come up. Ira. And Tiffany, what declaration are you making in front of the congregation today? 
Emily, Emily and, and Ezra, Ezra, our, our commitment, commitment to you as your parents, parents is to be committed to God as the center and heartbeat of our family life. To train and encourage you with an orientation toward God. To teach you God's word. To instruct and model for you how to love and obey God. To provide for you. To correct you in love and gentleness. To love you unconditionally as a reflection of how God loves you. And to lead and guide you in Jesus Christ. Why don't you move down just a little bit this way? Buttermore family, if you could step forward as well. Everyone gather around. Brent and Natalie, Ira, Tiffany. Is it your desire to publicly give thanks to God for the gift he has given you and these children? And do you wish today to present these children before the Lord as a gift designed for his glory and for his purpose? Will you commit yourselves today to live by God's grace and help as examples for these children and to instruct them diligently in all the ways of the Lord? They said, I do. Now it's your turn. Church family, I'm going to invite you to stand if you are inclined to. Church family, will you commit yourselves today by God's grace and help to love, encourage, support these parents and these families in their efforts to model for their children how to love, honor, and obey the Lord? Pray with me. I would invite any of you, if you want to come forward around the stage, you can do that. If you, you just want to pray for these families where you are, you can do that as well. Uh, please have freedom in this place. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this, these families. Thank you for the Buttermore and the Bosher family and, and what you have done in their lives and what they have committed themselves to today. Their family, their supporters. Lord, would you take care of them? Would you bless them? Would you enable them? to model and instruct for these children how to love and obey the Lord? Would you encourage them and strengthen them? Would you give them everything that they need so that they can orient their lives around Jesus Christ and so that one day these children will come to a point where they call on you, they turn from their sins, they repent, they confess that they need a Savior, and they call on you, Lord Jesus, to save them. Lord, would you do your work in these families? Would you bless their, the, the grandparents and the, the aunts and uncles and cousins and all of the supporters? Lord, would you give them uncommon grace? Would you give them your strength, your encouragement as they provide strength and encouragement and love and support for these families? Father, I pray, I pray for this congregation that we can live out what we have said we intend to do to love and support these families, to have an environment here where the name of Jesus Christ is lifted high. Lord, would you, by your grace, would you enable us to walk out, to live out what we have declared here today? Thank you for these families. Thank you for the Buttermore family. Thank you for the Bosher family. Lord, I pray for your hand of blessing on them. Encourage them and strengthen them, we pray through that mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You could be seated. Round of applause. Off here. I just want to remind all of us of the importance. This is not just a ceremony. Right? This is a commitment that we're making to love and to support these families. This is an important tradition of the church. It's a biblical tradition, as I've shown you here this morning. And I would encourage you to get to know these families, come around these families. Don't just let it stop, this dedication, stop with this ceremony today. Surround these families with your love and care and concern. Encourage them. Set an example for them here in the church body. We are a family and we're going to hear more about that now. I want to introduce and bring to the stage Pastor Charlie. Thank you, Blaine. Oh, 
Praise God for you guys. I don't know that I've ever gotten applause for coming up to talk, but um, I suppose I'll take it. Hey guys, this is an important day in the life of our church, and uh, we're calling it all in because we're celebrating what God is doing in the life of all of his church. And so uh, the people being baptized, the people uh, dedicating their, ch- their children, this isn't just about them. This is about all of us because we're all part of God's community here. And we'll celebrate that through communion at the end of the service. Um, and, and Blaine said this word ordinance and I'll unpack that a little bit, but this idea of us celebrating the ordinances of the church or the orders of the church that God has ordained for us to do, and those two ordinances are baptism and communion, and so we'll celebrate communion later, but I want to talk a little bit about baptism because baptism is incredibly important. It's important because it's huge in the New Testament pattern and life of the church, it's important to Jesus, and therefore, it should be important to us. And so, in the next 15 to 20 minutes or so, I'm just going to talk a little bit and answer these questions. What is baptism? Who is it for? And consequently, who isn't it for? What does it do? And what does it not do? And then last, just answer the question, why should you and I be baptized. So I just want to pray for us that God would open our hearts. So just pray with me. Lord, we come before you and we open your word and we ask God that you would use your word by your spirit to help us grow in knowledge of ourselves and knowledge of you so that we might better walk with you and worship you with our entire lives. We just pray for your presence now to open our eyes and open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So question one, what is baptism? And we say this or something very similar to this a lot here at Oak Point. Baptism is an outward sign. It's an outward sign of an inward faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So it's this outward sign of an inward faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Lord and Savior. And so this outward sign, many of you have seen this. We've got our little baptism tank here. People get in the tank and they go down in the water and then they come up out of the water and then people cheer and they clap and, and they scream. And it's awesome, right? It's awesome. And it's awesome because it represents the gospel at work in our life. It represents the gospel at work in our life. And when we enter the waters of baptism, and by the way, that word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or dunk or immerse. So that's why we call it water baptism sometimes. But anyway, it's when we enter the waters of baptism, we're proclaiming the gospel message. Did you know that? When you are baptized, you're actually proclaiming in a dramatization, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life again. And by joining in baptism, we publicly identify ourselves with Christ. That is the outward sign of baptism. And the apostle Paul explains this in Romans 6, 3 and 4. And he says this, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Meaning that when we go down to the water, that not only represents Christ's death and he died for our sins, it represents our death to our old self, that we're leaving our old self behind when we go down. And then when we're in the water, this is what Paul continues, says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so when we come out of the water, it represents represents the work of the Spirit that has given us new life in Christ. And so that's kind of what that outward sign means, 
that when we come out of that water, we have publicly declared that we are part of God's family, that we are part of God's kingdom, that we're going to live our lives for Jesus. It's actually pretty simple. So what is baptism? It's an outward sign of an inward reality that I have said yes to Christ. I put my faith in Christ and I want to live for Christ. So a couple metaphors. I know that you guys are wondering, why is he wearing a Hawkeye sweatshirt? I mean, aside from it, it is the best logo in all of college athletics. I mean, let's just be honest. And some of you are like, who's Iowa? Is that where they grow potatoes? No, that's home of the Hawkeyes, the greatest sports college team in all. And somebody's shaking their head, no, because, and that's okay. That's okay. But I wear this sweatshirt to identify that I'm a Hawkeye fan. This, this shirt, this sweatshirt doesn't make me a fan. This sh- shirt tells you all that I must be a fan. And you know I'm a fan because they were terrible against Wisconsin. Absolutely embarrassing. But that doesn't matter because I am still a fan. But that, that fandom, that love for the Hawkeyes is inside. And my sweatshirt just shows it to you. And, and like baptism is like we put on our Jesus jersey and we proclaim to the world that we follow Christ. Another metaphor that we use here a lot at Oak Point is it's like putting on the wedding ring of faith. You've heard that before. It's like when I put on this wedding ring and when, when Martha, my wife, put on her wedding ring, it, it symbolizes the promises and the covenant that we made to one another to be husband and wife. And I can take this off. Well, I can't really, but I could take this off and I would still be married, right? And then I could put it back on and nothing changed. I'm still married because it's a symbol of the covenant promises that we have made to one another. And this symbol tells and reminds us of those, but not only that, it tells the whole world that I belong to somebody else. And so when you step into that baptismal tank, it doesn't say that you're saved. It just tells the world that you belong to Jesus. I think we're getting it, right? Are we getting it, church? Yes, right on. So when we define baptism in this way, that it's this outward sign of this inward faith that we already have in Jesus Christ, it helps us understand the second question, who is baptism for and who is it not for? And this is very simple. This is very simple. Baptism is for someone who has already said yes to Jesus. Baptism is for someone who has already said yes to Jesus. It doesn't matter what the time period, it can be like a second You could say yes to Jesus and dive into that tank over there, or it could be a little longer period. But always in scripture, we see in the sequence, it's faith in Christ, baptism, belief in Christ, baptism, receiving Christ, baptism. Here's just a few scripture examples so you know that I'm not making this up. So I don't make things up. I just say what's in here. Acts 2.41, Peter gives this awesome gospel message at Pentecost, and it says this, those who accepted his message were what? Were then baptized, and about 3,000 were added. So accepted the message, baptized. Acts 8.12, but when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. They received the message, They were baptized. And it goes on and on. Acts 10 tells the story of how the Holy Spirit, while Peter's preaching to Cornelius in his house, the Holy Spirit comes on them. And then what happens next? They were baptized. Belief, baptism. Acts 16 tells how the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to the gospel. And then she was what? You guessed it. And over and over it happened. The Philippian jailer and Crispus and on and on and on. They receive, they believe, and their baptism. So baptism is for those who have already believed, already put their faith in Christ. And that's why we call it believer's baptism. You heard Blaine say that. It's a believer's baptism. So then who is it not for? Well, it's obviously not for 
unbeliever. And it's not because we don't want unbelievers to believe so that they can be baptized. We just don't want them to get baptized so they can be part of a club. Like if you're here today and you're not a Christian, that's okay. We want you to keep seeking. But we wouldn't recommend that you get baptized because that's not the meaning of it. The meaning is that you say, I'll be baptized because I want to show everybody who I follow. That's why we get baptized. Now, the other question that we get asked here at Oak Point is, do you baptize infants? Or why do you not baptize infants? And we would say that baptism is not for infants. And we say that because we just don't think that infants can consciously make a decision to believe and follow Christ. They can't understand what it means to follow the gospel. So let's go back to our two metaphors, right? Remember the sports team metaphors? How many have seen, or maybe you're not guilty of this, but how many of you dress up your little infant babies in a little Michigan onesie or a Michigan State onesie or a little cheerleader outfit? How, yeah, you do that. Do you do that because your child is actually a fan? No, you do it because you're a fan and you want them to grow up and not be an Ohio State fan, right? That's... <laughs> You want them to stay true to the blue and maize. So let's be honest. These children can't decide. They don't even know what a touchdown is. It's, it's the faith. It's the fandom of their parents. That's why we don't baptize. In the same way, let's go with our other metaphor. How many of you have little daughters, and when they were two and three and four, they put, they put on a, a, a white bed sheet, and they got your high heels on, and they came out with a potted plant, and they're like, I'm playing marriage. It's their wedding day, and they're playing it, and you think that's so cute. But if my daughter really wanted to come up to me at four years old and say, hey, I want to marry Johnny across the street. And I'm like, you mean that kid with the dried snot and the orange fishy cracker stain on his shirt? And I'd be like, no way. Not in your right mind. Why? Because I simply know that she can't comprehend what marriage is. And she's not prepared to put on that wedding ring. So that's the first reason we don't baptize babies. And the second time, the second reason we don't baptize babies is just you will find no instances in New Testament where specifically an infant is baptized. You just won't find it. Of the 77 times the word baptize or baptism is used, it not one time references an infant being baptized. And we need to be really careful that we don't create doctrines out of things that aren't in the Bible because they sound like good ideas. And you might be thinking, well, wait a second. I was baptized as a baby. And if you were baptized as a baby, that's okay. We just don't ascribe to that. And that's typically in your Reformed, your Presbyterian, your Lutheran, in your Catholic traditions, that's typically, I was part of a Reformed church for a long time. Martha and I were there for 17 years. And they practiced what they called covenantal theology. And it's, it's a beautiful idea, but it looks, a, it's actually a lot more like our baby dedications because they equate circumcision, which males were circumcised in the Old Testament on the eighth day. They equate that to baptism in the new covenant. The problem with that is circumcision was an external means of entrance into God's covenant family. And in the New Testament, the only means to enter God's covenant community and family is through the shed blood of Christ and faith in Jesus. And again, what can infants not do? They can't put their faith in Christ. So that's why we simply dedicate and we don't baptize because when we read the Bible, when we study the whole counsel of God, we see over and over again that it's faith in Christ and it's baptism over and over again in the New Testament. So it's not for infants. So then, what does baptism do or not do? What does baptism do or not do? So the first thing I want to say is baptism does not save. And Blaine already said that. Did a great job. Thanks, Blaine. But baptism does not save. And if you are from a Catholic tradition, you might have been taught, well, wait a second. We're required to baptize our infants so that they 
could be saved or would be saved. And if you would probably taught in the Catholic tradition that one of two things. One, you were taught that you had to baptize your baby because there was a special grace that's given to your baby that would one day allow them to be saved. And that's beautiful. That idea is beautiful. And though we do believe that something supernatural happens, we just know it is not salvation. And there's not biblical evidence of that in the scripture. And the second thing you might have been taught if you came from a Catholic tradition is that you actually have to be baptized to be saved, whether you're an infant or not. That is actually a means of salvation. And so we just don't ascribe to that because we don't find evidence in the Bible. And if you are like, wait a second, I've believed this my whole life. I just want to invite you to connect with one of our community pastors with me after the service, and we can really drill down if you'd like to, if you have questions about this. But we would ascribe that baptism, because it's a work, it can't be salvific. Why? Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. It's the work of God at work in your heart internally. Baptism is just an outward sign. Okay? Are we tracking? So who's it for? Believers. Who's it not for? Everybody else. All right. So let's keep going. So then you might ask, okay, well then, should I be baptized? Should you be baptized? And I would say, yes, you should. And you might say, but why? Because you have an inquiring mind. And so I'm going to give you the answer. You should be baptized because Jesus commands it as the next step, as a step in our journey with him. It's quite simple. He commands it. Let's go back to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We talked about this a few weeks in the mission. Remember the Great Commission? Well, Jesus puts baptism right in the center of it. He says this, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. So my question is, do we think it's important for us to go and share the gospel and bring the means of salvation so that people would follow and believe and become a disciple? Do we believe that's important, church? Do we, be yeah. Do we believe it's important to teach the counsel of God so that we could know and live and obey his word? Do we believe that's important? Yeah. Do you think it was important to Jesus for us to be baptized? Yeah, because it's right there in the middle. He ordained it. That word of ordinance, it's because Jesus ordained it, or he ordered it. It's just part of the Christian life, and we see that in the New Testament over and over. That's why baptism is so important. It's so important. So if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, then I want to encourage you to be baptized, to be obedient. God has something for you in this baptism. It's something that we don't have to do. It's something that we get to do. And there is blessing in obedience. Jesus said that himself in Luke 11. There is blessing in obedience. And that word blessing, that blessed, that just means that you are filled and you are full. And ask anybody that gets out of the tank after they've been baptized, they will tell you that they feel the presence of God. And you could see the joy on their face because they are being blessed. They're being filled by God. It's something that we get to do. So you might be asking, well, what if I've been baptized as an infant? Should I be baptized again? Or I got baptized at a summer camp and I just did it because a cute girl got in before me and I wanted to be in the club. And I just want to say, if you have never been baptized following you putting your faith in Christ, you haven't been baptized because you said, I want to show the world that I've put my trust and my hope and my faith in the one and only in Christ, then I would say, yeah, 
get baptized. Get baptized again. And there's biblical precedence of this. I know that some of you, if you grew up in the tradition that I did in the Reformed Church, you were like, you don't get rebaptized. Once is enough. And I'm just saying that in Acts 19, this is a really cool story. Paul's in Ephesus and he runs into this crew of guys. And they're like, hey, we don't have the Holy Spirit. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And Paul's like, well, then, then by what name were you baptized? And they were like, well, we were baptized in John, the Baptist's baptism. And if you remember that, that was a baptism of a repentance. That wasn't baptism in the name of Jesus. And so Paul's like, whoa, well, let me tell you about Jesus. And he tells them about Jesus. And they respond and believe, and they get rebaptized in the name of Jesus as true believers in Christ. So if you have gotten baptized as a baby, or you've gotten baptized on a dare, or because you wanted to be part of the club, or you just like to be wet, or whatever, then we want to encourage you, if you have said yes to Jesus, get baptized. It's something that we get to do. We get to show our love for God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by getting into that tank and going all in. You get to say, I'm putting my Jesus jersey on. You get to say, I'm putting on this wedding ring of faith and I'm going to declare that I belong to Jesus. And I've got to believe, I've got to believe that the Father is pleased when we do this. Because remember in Mark, Jesus, he gets baptized by John the Baptist and he comes out of the Jordan River and the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And what does the Father say? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I just have to imagine that when you come out of that water, God is looking down and saying, this is my daughter who I'm well pleased. This is my son who I'm well pleased. That's our invitation. It's our next step. And that is to be baptized. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just ask one for your forgiveness for the times that we have just lessened the value of baptism. And I pray, Lord, for each and every person here who has not been baptized but has said yes to you, that you might work in their hearts, that they might take their next step. No matter how long it's been, Lord, we pray that there would be no pride that keeps us out, that there would be nothing about convenience or the fact that we don't want to get wet in front of other people. God, would you move in our hearts and would you call us just to the simple obedience? And then Lord, would you bless the response. We thank you, God, that we get to participate with you in this ordinance to represent your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And lastly, God, we just thank you for those who have said yes today, who publicly want to put on their team colors, they want to put on that wedding ring of faith, and they want to say, I belong to you. Would you bless them and bless this time in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right. It's already been said quite clearly. Um, this really is a declaration of faith this morning. And so we sang a song a few minutes ago. I have decided to follow Jesus. And as Charlie stated, this is the first step in that uh, journey with Jesus is to be baptized. You know, for centuries, Christians have declared their faith through the ordinance of baptism. And uh, I often think, what would happen if the Bible were banned in America? Well, you know what? We could still declare the gospel of Jesus through the ordinance of baptism because it is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So today we have Larry coming, and uh, Larry has expressed uh, his faith in Jesus to me. And so, Larry, uh, do you have a few words you'd like to say? Well, Charlie, I was baptized as a baby and I meant to bring my baptism gown, which I no longer can fit in, but 
Uh, I forgot it, as usual. Uh, but this is my declaration saying that Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I want to follow him, and I want to do more for him and more for Oak Point. Thank you. Well, Larry, because you've declared your faith in Jesus Christ this morning, it is our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's awesome, isn't it? Amen. Well, we also have the privilege today to get to baptize Reagan. And we're super excited about this because it doesn't matter what age you are, right? Whether you're Reagan's age, whether you're Larry's age, you can declare your faith in Jesus Christ. And as I got to talk to, to Reagan, I was so excited. I said, Reagan, how long have you been following Jesus? And she's like, before I was born. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, when my mom used to listen to Christian music, I used to be bopping around in my mom's belly the whole time, and I've been doing it ever since. And I was like, that's awesome. And yet at that time, she still said it. But I have, uh, when I came to understand, put my faith in Jesus Christ. And she's going to read you her testimony right now. Hi, my name is Reagan Young, and I'm in fifth grade. I am 10 years old. I have been going to church my whole life. In fact, when I was a baby my, in my mom's belly, she used to say I, during praise and worship time, I danced. I was seven years old and starting second grade when my mom and dad let me go to Spring Hill Day Camp. On the last day of camp, I decided I wanted Jesus to be my forever friend. One of the camp counselors named Hannah prayed with me, and that's when I asked Jesus into my heart. I asked God to, for, to forgive my sins. I felt glad that I was a Christian. I felt like that I am a much better person than what I was before. I am totally cha it has totally changed my life. I am glad that now I have I will always I have Jesus to always talk to when I need him or when things get hard. I want to be baptized today because I love God and I want you to know. That's awesome. And that's what we're going to do. We get to baptize you today, Reagan. So let me ask you a couple questions. Do you love Jesus Christ and if you put your faith in him? Yes. Today, do you want to declare to everybody here that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes. All right. Because of your testimony of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This is what it's all about. This is why we do all in. It's because we want to see what happened with those first families that were up here. We want to see that happen in those families. And we should live for this church to see people profess their faith. And that's why it's so important to Jesus. That's why he ordains it. That's why he orders it. And he said that if you profess me before men, I will profess you before my father. It's just how we show that we love him. And did you hear that? Those people wanted to say, I wanna follow Jesus and I wanna do more for him. I wanna live my life for him. I love it. 
this is what we get to be a part of when we bring the gospel, when we teach God's word, when we help people walk in obedience, we get to see the fruit of it. Now we know, whenever you see Larry, whenever you see Reagan, you know that they're wearing the team colors. You know that they're following Jesus and then you can encourage them and you can help them along the way. That's why we're all here. We're the family of God. We're the family of God. And the second ordinance the family of God does is we take communion together. And just like baptism is something that we do once as a believer, communion is something that we do over and over again to remember the death of Christ. And I think it's just because we sin over and over and we need to be reminded. And so if you don't have your communion cup, I wanna encourage you to, to go grab one and, and they're noisy so you can go ahead and open this. But here's the, here's the word from Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23. And he's speaking of communion. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we do this, we remember and we proclaim. And just like in baptism, we proclaim the gospel at work in us. When we take communion, we proclaim that he died for our sins. And so just, I wanna take a quick time out. If you are here today, and there's something stirring in you and you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never said yes to Jesus and there's something going on and you've been inspired, you've heard this gospel, I just wanna say it's probably Jesus knocking on the door of your heart saying, are you ready to open the door and let me in? You're not gonna regret it. So if you're here today, I just wanna give it to you because there's bad news and then there's good news. And the bad news is, is that you are a sinner. I am a sinner. We're all sinners. And unfortunately, because God is perfect and holy, his word tells us that the wages of sin is death. And that death means eternal separation from him and what we call hell. And it's not nice and it's not good. His intention for us is to be united forever, to be in relationship, to experience his presence and his glory and his love and all the fulfillment that we could ever imagine and far beyond. That's God's intention. But because of our sin, the bad news is, is we lost it. But the good news is, it's for God so loved the world and he loved you. No matter how bad you think you are, or maybe worse yet, you think you're good enough to skate by and you're not. But God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe might not perish, but have eternal life life. And that is the good news. And all we need to do is receive it. Just like all those people in scripture, we just need to receive that. Romans tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we would be saved. And so I'm going to give you a minute or two just to reflect on that. And if God's stirring in you and you wanna take that step today and you wanna say yes, then you just talk to him. Say, I believe, I wanna live my life for you. And if you do that, we wanna invite you to take communion.
you just get up out of your chair and you go get one of these things and you take communion with us because you're in the family when you say yes to Jesus. And if you're here and you're visiting because you came to see a baptism or you're from a different tradition and you're wondering, can I come and can I take communion? Yes. The communion table at Oak Point is open to anyone who confesses Christ as Lord and Savior. So come to the table and enjoy and celebrate and remember. But Paul does give us a warning in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, 27. And he writes this. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. And this is what Paul is saying is, just take note of what's going inside. Don't take this lightly. Jesus hung on a cross, bruised and beaten. And then he died so that you might live. Don't take that lightly. So just examine yourself, come before him, confess your sin, give him praise for that fact that he died for you. And then I'll lead us back together and we'll take communion together at once. Let's pray. Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat it. And after they took the bread in the same way, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. It's my blood. It's poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink this, all of you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder today that you are at work in the life of your church, that you, God, have next steps for each and every one of us, and you're calling us and inviting us to publicly declare, to publicly commit, to go all in not because you want something from us, because you want something for us. You want to bless, you want to fulfill. And you want it not just for the people in this room, God, you want it for the people out there as well. And so God, would you stir in our hearts to be people who publicly proclaim you? Would you stir in our hearts to be people who worship you with our whole lives? And lastly, Lord God, would you, Would you make us bold to go proclaim the good news that you died, you were buried, and you were raised to new life? And because of that, 
we get to experience that promise as well. God, we love you and we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up with me? Because scripture tells us after they had the last supper, they went out singing a hymn together. Let's praise him. Let's worship him. Let's give him thanks. Amen. Amen.
if you were like, I'm ready. I'm ready to proclaim it. I'm ready to be baptized. Or if you're a young family and you want to stand with your church and dedicate your children, then we would love for you to come and see one of the community pastors, Pastor Blaine, Pastor Dave, Pastor John, come see me, Pastor, anyone, anybody, just come and see us. And we have another all in Sunday scheduled for February 6th. So you can save the date, you can mark your calendar right now. I think that's a Sunday. If it's not, it's the Sunday that's close to February 6th, okay? Strategically placed, not on the Super Bowl and not on any other football day. It is the Lord's day to be all in. And we wanna invite you to come back and participate and publicly declare that, those words that we just sang on that song. Amen.